Foucher, hello and welcome to Keith's Whiskey Vlog. As you can see, it's another whiskey chat in this video, and I've got with me my friend Graham, fellow tour guide. Uh, it could be Whiskey Tour Guide Graham. Yes, could be. Fancy, yes. So, say hello to the people at home, Graham. Hello, people at home. <laughs> so, Graham is uh, into his whiskey, but he's a bit more near the start of his whiskey mm -hmm. journey, so I'm going to fill out his knowledge a little bit, hopefully, in this. So, before we start, or as we start, I'm going to get a little whiskey for you, Graham. And we're going to start off with my home brew. So I've got it in the Bowmore bottle, but I've got my Infinity bottle. So, welcome to Whiskey Tour Guide Keith Towers. And uh, see what you think of my Infinity. Have you, are you aware of the Infinity bottle? I'm not, no. Alright, good. That gives me the chance to explain it. Should have done that on the, the wooden board, but there we go. So Infinity Whiskey, Infinity, never ending, Keith's Infinity bottle, a bottle that never runs out. Mm. So you drink it, it goes down, and when it gets near the bottom, you pour in whatever you want. Ah, you right. can be scientific about it, you can try and hone it to the exact flavour you want. So what have I got in mind? That's what I've got in mind, I've got 15 whiskies at the moment. Mostly Islas, but I've got Glen Goyne, Lafroig, uh, Lagavulin, Glen Kinchy, Glen Rothis, Kilhoman, Highland Park, Talisker, various different types. So, nothing too sophisticated. Eyebrows raised. Mm, yeah, that smells good. So, what's your current favourite whiskey, Graham? It would have to be the Lagavulin 16. So, without my last fill, I put some of the Lagavulin 9 year old in. So, it's got a little bit of Lagavulin. Mm. But it should be in your ballpark, whether you like it or not. You don't, I, I will not be offended. Don't worry. I'm not saying it's the greatest whiskey in the world. But uh, what do you think of the Infinity? How does it smell? It smells lovely in the nose, actually. It really does. It's, 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 a, it's, it's much richer than when I first tasted it after my initial refill. Quite it's smooth. But this is batch two. Mm. It is quite smooth, it's a wee bit creaminess, but it's quite full, there's a lot to it, mm. it's got a lot of flavour, as well as that trademark whiskey do right Keith smokiness. Good way to start off. So, I'm welcoming you, but I thought I'd have one myself as well. And you've got a little lag of wheeling glass to go with it. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a wee bit of an aftertaste, eh? It's got a bit of the Glen Goyne cask mm. strength in it. The initial... Wow. The initial batch had some Glen Farkless 105, which is 60%, and the Glen Goyne cask strength is the late 50s, mm. 58, 59%. So it's got, it's got a real... Uh, you have to be careful when you're drink. drinking that, like. Try it with a wee bit of water, mm. see what it does. Do you add much water to your whiskey? Uh, maybe a drop or two, if that. Cool. I approve. There's no correct way to do it, but... Uh, I'll do it. See how it goes. If it's too much, you can still mm. beat it down a bit more. It's nice and fiery, that. You know, it's got a real um, after zing. <laughs> Don't know if that's a technical word or not. No, no, there are, there, are, there are no wrong answers. Mm. A wee bit fresher on the nose, I think. A wee bit more lemony somehow. Lemony, yeah, definitely lemony. I got that. Now, my palate's not brilliant, but no, no. I could get the lemon there. What I say, I've not got the greatest palate, but it's it's how it makes me feel and mm. where it comes from. If it hits you from the back, if it comes up from underneath, and it's stabbing you in the gut. I'm trying to think what was in it that might be lemony. So another thing with the Infinity Ball is that everything that you put in it, as long as it doesn't run out, it's always got some part of everything you've put in. Um, as an excellent idea. So you'll have to you have to go on it. Problem is, <coughs> I'm not leaving anything in the ball to, <laughs> to, to even get started. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's uh, I'm definitely going to try that. Uh, Infinity bottle. Infinity what bottle. It? And the bottle I chose was a Bowmore. So the Bowmore mm. is the oldest distillery in Isla. I'm a Isla whiskey fan. It's a nice bottle. It's got nice shoulders. Established 1779. So, very nice. Mm. So yes, so welcome to uh, Keith's Whiskey Videos. 
Belgium. And uh, yes, you got a little bit of Gaelic. A wee bit. Been learning uh, a little bit. I mean, push you for some. Have you a in Gaelic? You've got a little bit of Gaelic. I'm guessing. Ha Gaelic big I go. That means I have a little Gaelic. Uh, big, being small. Yes, aye. This is very confusing. Yeah, so I don't speak Gaelic myself, but little words here and there. So. Mm. Righty ho. Now, um, once we've had this, we've got a couple of glasses. I've had it. You can bring up the lag of the little 16. <laughs> some glasses up here. So, Graham, mm. kindly. Aye. Right. So, lag of the 16. So, we'll start off the evening with that. Graham's discovered the lag of the 16. It it's really is the, the pinnacle, I think. Favourite whiskey start at the top. I only bought it the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Halfway down. Hi. Right, so. So regular viewers know I'm on Isla quite often. I've been to Lagaville a few times. You've not been to Isla at all yet, Graham? I've never been to Isla, to my shame. So it's on the to-do list? It absolutely is. Along with many other of our wonderful wee islands. What islands have you been to? Hey? Well, Skye is my favourite place in Scotland right now. Uh, just, it's magical. I love it. And to my shame, I'd never been to Skye until I became a tour guide. And the first time I went to Skye was training to be a tour guide on Skye. But I fell in love with it almost immediately. It, it was, it really was. It was just, mm. and the stories around Skye are just lovely. They're, they're beautiful wee stories. And the, all these uh, kind of supernatural things that happen in the sky. And you can see why the, the islanders grew up believing uh, this stuff. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, when I got trained on the sky tour as a tour guide, that was my second time. So I'd been on my, well, not my, my, with my family, mm. but without a tour guide. And it was okay. It was just, is this it? Like, Aye. And then when I went with a tour guide, it's so much more informative. You, you, you get the stories about the mountains and the, the waterfalls and... But it's just, it's the giants and the fairies and the, the, the wee blue men and all these different kind of uh, wonderful characters that just bring bring it to life for me. You do get some cynics who don't believe in it, but uh, that's, it just gets them in trouble uh, with the fairies. If you, you upset <laughs> yeah, the fairies, exactly. then I so mean, be, it, be it on your own head. Every time I go there, I wash my face in the river. I'm, I'm 72, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, fighting them for their time. I tell that story then. Ah. So the River Sligachin, mm. the old Sligachin Bridge, what do the you do? Sligachin. You get down and you wash your face in the river and it will make you look instantly 10 years younger. How long does that last? Well, it only lasts while you're on the Isle of Skye. As soon as you leave the island, you come back to being a haggard old <laughs> wreck of a person. I, I thought it was silly news that gave you, but I uh, maybe... Ah, uh, well, we've heard different stories. Yeah. So, yeah, Sky, before you had science explaining things, you've got Celtic mythology and folklore. Anything big? How did the hills and the mountains get there? How did the cliffs form? That was the giants. How did that boulder land in that field? Um, obviously not glaciers or anything like that. It was giants having a fight, throwing things around. Anything small, the waterfalls, anything that went missing, that was the fairies. So they, they were mm. the explanation for everything. And uh, it's good fun if nothing else. When you I love the, the the whole thing about the old man's store. You know, it's not really called the old man's store. Nope. The original Gaelic name, I and mean, it was the old penis of store. Yes. And uh, you, somebody got very Gaelic embarrassed. Um, it'll come back to me. <sighs> I didn't know it once. Uh, yeah, I, so did I, but it'll come back to me. But through translation, they were too embarrassed to say it means the penis of store. So they changed it to the old man of Stoth. There you go. It does look like a giant penis, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's the the punchline for the joke is uh, well. I mean, so the old man of Stoth, in case you don't know, it's a sort of rock pinnacle at the end of a mountain range, the Trotternish Ridge on the sky. And there's all sorts of stories about how it got there. You get boring people who will call scientists who say it was erosion and landslips and stuff like that. But uh, according to folklore, mythology, there were two giants that had a fight, and the old man of Stor, one of the giants slayed one of the other giants, and this is his big toe that's sticking up. But some people like Graham are a little bit more crude, and they think it's maybe not his big toe, it's something else. Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. Spent over. But it was venerated uh, by the um, the original kind of inhabitants of the islander as a, a phallic symbol. It was a, a, a fertility, fertility dance. Sort of yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. So yeah, if you visit Sky, you'll see the old man on postcards, websites. You, you'll see it if you go anywhere near Portree as well, as long as there's not too much cloud cover. <laughs> well, yeah. Have you been the uh, walk up to the old man? No, uh, it's about from the, the road, well, it's about 45 minutes probably to get up there, and it's having time, but sometimes if it's really cloudy, it's the only way to see it, mm-hmm. is to actually walk up there, mm-hmm. but um, yeah. When I first asked, I got told you need an hour and 43 minutes to get there and back. <laughs> All right, <So> okay. <laughs> I just always remembered mm. that. Right, uh, mm. so we're not, we're not drinking Isla Sky whiskey, we're drinking Lagavulin from Isla, but... Uh, so how did you come across this? Well, it's strange because I'd, I'd, I'd always thought that I disliked smoky whiskies. And I'd ever... When Why? I, I don't... Well, well the first one I tried... You tried the Laphroaig. I tried the Laphroaig in my 30s and I thought, that's like somebody's wiping sandpaper on my tongue uh, and then hit me in the face with an ashtray. I really don't want... I don't like this. So it put me off and I, I never tried any smoky whiskies, but then... On Sky, I was doing a, a tour, did a tasting at Talisker. Tried the Talisker, thought, hmm, wee bit salty, wee bit smoky, actually, that's not too bad. So then, um, I was in the pub one night on Sky, and I said, there, Lagavulin 16, I just tried it. And I thought, do you know, it was an utter revelation to me. I thought, that's the best whiskey I have ever drank in my life. It was pure honey down my throat it was wonderful it is it's something else uh, I've done a Lagavulin tasting video Lagavulin 16 year old obviously check that out but as most people will tell you uh, it's one of the best it's highly rated one of the best Scottish whiskies. I always call it the Rolls Royce of Scottish whiskey. Mm. so uh, it's not a surprise it's, you must have come to it at the right time just try one or two so so and then you just hit that yeah and but but it is, it's just mm. elegant and lush, and you, you just know you're in the company of someone special. But it didn't even taste that smoky to me at the time. I thought it was really subtle in, mm. in its smokiness. It was just, just kind of lingering there. Just well, <coughs> well yeah. balanced, basically. Mm. No. Good stuff. So, do you drink it neat? Do you add any, any water to your lagavulin? I always drink it neat. I never add water. I've never actually added water to it. Um, well, when you get near the end, add some, just to yeah. see what that... We're, we're, being, we're being like um, professional here. We're, we're doing mm. proper tastings mm-hmm. rather than just swally in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good swally. Yeah, yeah of course. Mm. Um, so, when I first shared a whiskey with Graham, and we're drinking leg of Woolens, and he's told me that story, he didn't like the previous Islas that he's tried. I was like, right, okay, so if you've tried the Lefroy 10 and you don't like it, fair enough. Everyone's got their own tastes, but you do like the leg of Woolen. So the Lefroy generally is the sort of the noisy teenager, the, the, the Asbo of Scottish whiskies. The leg of Woolen is your sort of warm, sort of fireside hug, mm. almost. So, um, I then introduced Graham to the Laphroaig Quarter Cask, which I've also reviewed, check out mm. that review as well. Now, when I did the Laphroaig reviews, I tasted the 10-year-old, the Quarter Cask, and the Triplewood, which are three of the core range at Laphroaig. And I was a wee bit surprised that side by side, the Quarter Cask was my favourite. So, I knew that it was appreciably different from the, the 10-year-old, and if you like the Lagavulin mm. 16, give the Quarter so Cask what would a wee try. The difference between the quarter cask and the ten. Why is the quarter cask different? Um, why is it different? So they're all the same core spirit. So mm. like Lafroig, make their spirit and then they put it in the barrels and start aging it. So up to about four years, the ten year old and the quarter cask are exactly the same. Yeah. But then they just continue aging the the, the, the ten year old on, and they take the the spirit out of the bourbon cask, the normal sized casks. And put it into quarter sized casks okay and then it's about maybe a, a year or so longer uh, i can't remember the exact time scale and in the quarter casks it's got much more contact with the wood because it's smaller so it's a more intense so it finishes a bit quicker mm. did there be less uh angel share and stuff going on there as well yeah, yeah. Like so the longer you mature it the less you've got um i don't know exactly how much you'd lose in the quarter cask to the angel share but mm. less because you're just purely you're 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 maturing it for a shorter time so yeah. you're gonna lose less. 
So it's just um, a more sort of intense flavour. Mm. I suppose the longer you leave it in the original cask, it's just going to get that sort of lifelike smokiness that they're aiming for. The quarter cask with the more intense mm. flavour. I don't know exactly why why there's much of a difference, but just tasting them. But it makes a difference, yeah, clearly, really, because. Uh, I can't remember the exact percentage either. The Lafroy 10 is, I think, 40%, and the quarter cask, I think, is 46% as well. Yeah, so that kind of bears out it's losing less of the alcohol during during its maturation. Absolutely. Mm. So, thus far, I've uh, got Graham onto the Lafroy quarter mm. cask, and he was a wee bit surprised to find that he liked it. Love so that. I said, well, you're going to have to come and do a whiskey video and I will Feed you happily whiskey. take a 16 year old <laughs> and then I will <coughs> take you through some of the more uh, the Isla core range whiskies mm. from different distilleries so Graham has not tried most of the ones I'm going to be feeding him um, we'll see what he thinks and we're going to start off uh, Lagavulin, I don't know it's, it's 8 out of 10 on the, the punchy scale on Isla your, your Lafroigs and Kilhome and Macar Bays at the 10 mm. your Beaumores and Kalilas are maybe 4 or 5 Buna Havens right down to 1 or 2 so you've got a, a sort of punchy uh, an aggressive scale on Isla so I'm going to start you off and build you up and see where we go sounds good so we'll finish this Aye. and then we'll get on with uh, uh, the rest of the whiskies Okay, dokie, so I'm going to get pouring some whiskies. Uh, the two whiskies that I'm going to start off with for whiskey tour guide Graham <laughs> are two from Isla. The Bowmore 12 year old and the Kalila 12 year old. Mm. Now, uh, as you know, Graham is a tour guide as well, so he's visited a few distilleries. Uh, you mentioned you'd visited the Lindor's Abbey distillery. What's your what's your thoughts on Lindor's? I mean, Lindor's, mm. is, it was the oldest and at one point the youngest distillery in Scotland, because that is where the first records of whisky making in Scotland are from, the monks at Lindor's Abbey. Yeah. And recently they've opened a new distillery. They've just released a three-year-old. So what's your, what's your take on Lindor's? Well... You talk about that, and I'll get these. <laughs> I, 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 we we tried the Aqua Vitae, and well, it, it, it's a strange kind of flavour. There's there's nothing really there. It's it's quite empty. There's, there's obviously no maturation in it. It's just the the distilled spirit. So it, it's hard to to pin anything on it on, in terms of flavour. But I always found that uh, maybe you can confirm this. But the so. It, Distillation, the, the whole process was, was created in uh, North Africa, the, the Moors, and, and they brought it back from the Crusades. So that's how distillation, or the whole whisky kind of making uh, process started in Scotland. So somebody went, a Scottish knight went to the Crusades in North Africa and seen them distilling alcohol to clean wounds on a battlefield and thought, I know, I'm going to take that home. And we're going to drink that. That's a great <laughs> idea. And that's what happened at Lindor's. They, they made this alcohol that was supposed to be cleaning wounds on the battlefield and decided to drink it. I think that's fantastic. Absolutely. Well, we'll drink anything in Scotland, obviously. Uh, I was, wasn't sure. I once got asked about uh, the bagpipes. Where did the bagpipes come from? And it was mm. something, well, it was, it was a sort of single pipe. It was similar in China. Mm. And then it made its way along the silk routes. It got to... Um, the Romans at the Middle East and then it made its way up to Europe and then it was along sort of Spain up the west coast of France and all the way there was like bits getting added and extra pipes and the extra bag and different holes and up to Ireland and it eventually made its way to Scotland and I was like alright it was a tour guide that told me this and then a wee while later I was like and have you any idea about whiskey I was uh, where, where did whiskey come from I said, oh, it started in China they started distilling sort of perfumes and then it made its way along the south and I was like is this the same story as the, the bagpipes? <laughs> like, ah, I'm a tour guide. So I thought it came from China originally, but it's, it's definitely made Aye. its way. But each step of the way, there's been something else. So it wasn't alcohol originally. They were distilling stuff. They were distilling like petals and making perfumes and medicines. And then um, what they say about what did they say about whiskey is that um, the Irish invented it, the Scots perfected it, and the Americans are still trying their best. So it's just okay. as it comes. <laughs> Um, but I so I so, right, so what have we got here? Right, so the two here we've got the Kalila and we've got Bomore. So mm -hmm. the Bomore twelve year old, 
um, and Kalila. So Bomor is part of Beam Suntory, uh, their sort of portfolio. It's the oldest distillery on Isla, and Kalila is part of Diageo now, which mm. is uh, Diageo owned the most distilleries. People have opinions on Diageo, good and bad. I think that there's, there's good points and bad points. It's an international conglomerate, they siphon off the profits. But at the same time, they offer that sort of stability to distilleries that are in the more mm. remote areas. They'll tarmac the car parks, they'll invest in the visitor centre, and they've got sort of better international promotion and mm. things as well. So, I mean, it's uh, pick, your, pick your medicine, pick your evils, it's um, good and bad. Yeah. Uh, Kalila's a good distillery. So, Kalila, that means love, Isla. Kalila. Uh, well, it ca- comes with Kyle. So, like mm. Kailakin, Kaila Lokaus, ah, right, Kyle okay. is Sea Straits or Sea Narrows. Ah. So, Kalila is the, the, the Sea Narrows, the Sea Straits of Isla, which is right between Isla and Jura. Um, on the, let me think mm. of the, map, the east coast of Isla, uh, you've got Bunahaven, Ardnahoe, and Kalila, both all overlooking the sound of Isla. Um, just, I don't know, a mile maybe across is the Isle of Jura. So Kalila, the streets of Isla. Mm. Isla is Isla. Kyle, mm. Kalila. Okay. So that's where that comes from. Um, so what's love? Are you saying? Well, I'm thinking cool, cool, cool. Just C U L maybe. Mm. Is it? I don't know. Uh, see, it's spelled the same. I'm All pretty right. sure. But but that, this is the thing with Gaelic words. There are so uh, it's the same as English words. There are many different. I'm sure so uh, cool. Uh, I don't know. It's the sound of Isla. Anyway, I want to taste yes. it. Right, so right, which one's the Kalila? Uh, the front one, the lighter coloured mm. one. So that's your Bowmore. Now, when I'm introducing people to Isla whiskey, I will usually go for one of these two. Usually the Bowmore, but the Kalila as well. Start off with the Kalila. So mm. we'll go for the front one. So have a little nose, have a little taste, and then tell me what you think. What, what flavour notes are you getting, Graham? <laughs> Under pressure now. Yeah. Do you get any smoke? Aye, it be subtle. That's quite subtle. So, as I say, I class it as quite a sort of medium one. I tend to get a, a creaminess, sort of vanilla creaminess. Mm. Uh, maybe more in the mouth, but certainly. A little bit in the nose. So it's not too offensive. You can detect it's got a bit of smoke, it's a bit of isla. Ooh, very smooth. Smooth, mm. so it's that creaminess. It's it's not too jaggy. It's not burning you. No, nope. it's very. Uh, mm. but it sounds weird, but a bit waxy. I don't know. It's a bit, um, feels like it's coating me a little bit. So I'm getting a tingle on my tongue. I'm getting more smoke, more earth than on the nose. Deep thought. Enjoying it? Mm. Not so no, good. It's very nice. Medium. It's lovely. You know, it's mm. not as honeyed as the. No. The I wouldn't one, say it's that sweet. No. Just smooth, quite mellow. Not too offensive. I think even po- folk that don't like Islas could tolerate this. Reasonably straightforward. It's not too bad. So it's quite light in colour. Um, Kalila and Lagavulin are both Diageo and they're both mm. on Isla so that's the two that Diageo have on Isla and the Lagavulin a bit controversially does get coloured it gets that caramel colour added to it really? so this ah. doesn't I don't understand why it does because taste alone the caramel addition doesn't alter it at all just purely visual so the, the Lagavulin would be more of this colour then? If, if it must be I don't know state. but it must be otherwise they wouldn't add it Exactly. So you'll know that in bourbon casks you get a little bit, li- little bit less mm. colour. In sherry casks you get a bit more colour. But uh, twelve-year-old Kalila, beautiful starter whisky for Isla. So leave that now. We'll move on to the Bamore. So Bamore, what's your initial interpretations, name-wise? Have you got any? Well, more is big. Yep. Uh, Bo, Bo, I'm not. So sure about uh, and the signs in Gaelic it's B O G H. I don't know if that helps at all or means anything. Uh, 
So it's probably something to do with the landscape. I um, understand it's a it's a, a reef. So ah, it's like the big reef. Right. Okay. Uh, I believe I want to double check that, but anyway, there you mm. go. So that's where the name comes from. Uh, single malt, twelve year old, minimum age twelve year old, and like the infinity bottle that I've got, it's got on the bottle number one volts. So these are relatively famous in whiskey terms, and the number one bolts at Bowmore are the distilleries on the coast, and the vaults are below sea level. So whatever difference okay. that makes. So mm. you should be getting some more maritime notes. Right, but it'd be Briny, a bit saltiness. salty, mm. old rope that ties up boats, mm. all of that. So have a nose, have a... Have a oh, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> you can definitely, definitely smell the massive it's like a it's like a big punch in the f there's yeah. much more it hits the roof of your nose eh? it just, Aye. it's up there bang I mean that's so that was subtle and that was very so I'd call both of these quite subtle but, but mm, I don't you know should, if well, you should see where we're going after right. this but anyway so that's why I said the Kalila first and then the Bowmore so that's more your mm. gentle vanilla smooth there's a, there's a flavour note in this that I can just never get. It's an almost it's like an almost um, almost like play doh plasticine. I know what you some mean. Sort of, not quite rubber, but something uh, a wee bit chemically, but mm. not in a bad way. And, and well, you were chewing pencils at school. Ah, like the rubbers on the end of pencils, something like yeah. that. <sighs> oh no, man! Yeah, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> I definitely get that now. Yeah. So we we'll started off with a. Uh, the Keith Homebrew, the Infinity Bottle, which is quite smoky. And then we went to the Lagavulin 16. So we're coming down a little bit for the Kalila 12 and then started our wee journey up on the smokiness with the Bowmore 12. I'm loving the smell of that. That's amazing. So you've, you've just come into possession of a bottle of this, mm. I believe. Have you opened it yet? No, 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 no. I've not tried it yet. Good. Uh, I got it, it was uh, gone cheap in the local so supermarket. So was that's a bargain. Absolutely. So a little taste. Have you tasted it yet? No, it just keeps smelling. <laughs> <laughs> it's, quite right, it? uh, it's a bra smell, it really is. It's usually so what nice. I do in the pub, a pint and a whiskey, and I'll drink halfway down the pint before I even start in the whiskey. Wow. That's quite unexpected. A lot of woodiness. Mm, definitely. Uh, n none of that pencil rubber mm. that you get in the nose. So and the saltiness there. Can you taste the sub C? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm Whatever that be, is. Uh, aye, aye. Well, this has definitely been uh, distilled below uh, sea level. <laughs> Matured. <laughs> uh, uh, all the distilleries in Scotland that I've visited, Bowmore is my favourite smelling distillery. Right. When you get there just as you go in there's a beautiful mm. uh, waft off the sea and the maltiness of the distilling and the, it's just oh, uh, on, a, on a medium sort of warm day it's just mm. you just want to bottle it so can we that Bowmore the Bowmore's definitely got a bit more about it a bit more character I don't know what it is it just feels a bit so more thicker almost aye like. there's, there's it's like it wants to to punch you in the throat do you know what I mean you're going to be in deep trouble if you think this is a punch in the throat where we're going to be going. You're going to be roundly assaulted. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> oh, you're going to enjoy being assaulted, but you're going to be you're going to be kicked up and down Splendid. the place if you think yeah. this is a punch. Mm. Fair enough. So, mm. again, great with whiskey tasting. It's good having one side by side. So go back to the Kalila again once you've done the Bomore. Mm. The Kalila might have prepared you for the Bomore. Now that you've had the Bomore, it can prepare you back there for the Kalila. See what changes at all. Mm. Mm. There's a different smell to it this time. So a lot of the time, people who've tried whiskey don't like whiskey. You give them one of these, it's like, oh, that's uh, something different going on here. This isn't, is this whiskey? And you're like, yeah, yeah, this is Isla whiskey. So I, I find that quite a lot. And that especially happens with your Lagavulins and some things with your Lafroigs. Mm. But as I say, these are, we're, we're, we're going there later. Oh, that tastes a wee bit more, a wee oily kind of. Well, you said waxy, I think, the first time. Ah, waxy, oily kind of. It's still there, but it's more, 
for now. Because I felt that was that's a really strong flavour compared. I thought yeah. this is much more subtle. I think this is the first time I've tasted these side by side. So a wee bit but of it's water. It's interesting going between the two. I'm going for three drops mm. in the Kalila. So have you been to any Diageo distilleries? Uh, well, one that I've been to quite often, well, one that I've seen a, a huge change in is, uh, is Glen Kinchy. Uh, I've been there a couple of times before uh, Diageo went tonto on uh, up there. Yeah, yeah. But look, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. It's kind of like um, Disneyland for whiskey. It really is. It was about um, what, 10, 15 miles from Edinburgh. Yeah, yeah, and it's um, a lowland distillery. It is a lowland distillery, oh. and you know, it's it's a very nice whiskey. Well, I think what Dad you've been doing is what they call the four corners of Scotland. Yes. So Glen Kinchy's in the lowlands, Clyneleash, the way up Caithness, Sutherland direction, uh, Kalila. I, it's Kal I think it's Kalila or is it Talisker that they do? Or? No, no. I think it's Kalila. They've got in their, they've got a big map. They've got this big experience. They've, they've got this sensory room that you go into now. It's wonderful. You've got all different kind of mood lights it's going on. Glen Kinchy. In Glen Kinchy, and you've got little um, smelling papers where they'll they'll let you smell the different kind of flavors or or different kind of notes that are in the whiskey that they're producing. And, and some of them smell like old nappies and some of them smell like tyres that are burning on the road. That's my that favorite kind of stuff. The flavour that was a, a, a <laughs> yeah. of burning tyres. I was like, why, why would you Why would yeah. you know what that tastes like for a start? So they, they let you smell that kind of stuff and, and just get immersed in the whole the whole thing. So nappies. <laughs> yeah, well. Diapers for American well, things. Uh, kind of, um, just pre, that. Pre or post. <laughs> <laughs> Clean or uh, soiled. <laughs> Let's not go there, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to taste that whiskey, um, but uh, it's a great experience, and they've done. They've spent a lot of money on it, and they're opening the new Johnny Walker experience in the in the, <laughs> the top of Princess Street as well. So they're they're going to be doing all these things. Diageo are going mad. It's like they've taken over mm -hmm. Scotch whiskey. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not making one opinion one way or the other about it. Mm -hmm. They've done a lot of good for it. You know. Distilleries like Lagavulin like wouldn't have been able to retain their unique um, yeah. kind of or maintain it. Aye. aye, they wouldn't have been able to do that without Diageo's support. So fair play to them for that. But it does feel like they're kind of try that with the water first. Mm, it does feel like they're they're kind of got a bit of a it, monopoly. Sweeten it right up. Yeah. So as we speak, um, we live not far from Edinburgh. <clears throat> and the Adger are about to open the Johnny Walker Experience in Edinburgh. It's four or five floors, prime Edinburgh property, and it's going to be all about Johnny Walker and whiskey experience and sort of Johnny Walker being a blend. Um, it's going to talk you through the processes and the whiskies that go into it and all that sort of stuff. So quite interesting. I've said for a long time that Edinburgh is really under... Um, Sort of provided with whiskey experiences. You've got the Scotch Certainly whiskey has. experience at the mm. castle. I've said if somebody opens a distillery, they're going to be overwhelmed. Mm. We've got the Holyrood distilleries opened. Because um, the many passengers have asked me, oh, is, what do you recommend? We want to taste whiskey in Edinburgh. We're staying in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. Where do we go? And there are a few whiskey experiences, but mm -hmm. really, I think this is Diageo moving into exactly where they needed to They'll be in the take market. Everyone, absolutely. And 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 Princess, corner Princess Street, yeah. centre of Edinburgh. Go to, nailed go it. to Johnny Walker. Absolutely nailed uh, it. Yeah. Even whiskey bars. I went into. I'm obviously not going to name names, but I went. I did a wee bit of research recently. I went out with my brother. I went into a, a, a whiskey themed bar. Um, decent oh. reputation, mm. and I'm I'm a spoiled having been to Isla. I'm, I'm a bit. Aye. I'm a bit. I'm a, I'm a bit in all about it, but um, their Isla section they had thirteen Isla whiskies. Now there are nine Isla distilleries. Eight producing whiskey and I've just sort of opened so that's not that's one and a half whiskies per distillery it's hardly a selection at all and one of the whiskies in their Isla section was a Campbelltown whiskey so they only had 12 Isla mm. whiskies and this is a renowned whiskey city centre bar very disappointing so the more whiskey bars the more selection the more 
uh, options there are the better so even if you don't like blends maybe you don't like Johnny Walker it's good having a, a real whiskey attraction bang in the middle of Edinburgh what uh, did you think of the Kalila with the, the water in it? You, you're right it did sweeten it up um, I really did feel um, like it, well it was different on the tongue totally you, you could absolutely feel it and I think this where a couple of drops of water in is it's completely transformed it as well that's got a lot more real toffee hit I've never been I, I, I had a couple of drops of water in it and I was like oh no I'll just drink it straight and I, I never did that until somebody said well look it actually changes the molecular consistency of what you're it drinking. Breaks down the molecular compounds. Aye. Doing. So I was like, okay, well, okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> yeah, and, and it is right. It does. It does make a difference. Some there's almost no difference, mm. but most of the time you do get a, an appreciable difference. And if you don't like it, fine. But um, at least you know. <laughs> I didn't do water when I've done my tasting videos. <coughs> I much prefer with water. It just makes it mm. more palatable. So most I prefer without water. But, but see, I would never do it to the Lagavulin 16. I would just leave it as it is. We forgot to do it earlier, but you've, you've got no, to try. I'm not going to do that. Why change it? Ah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I like the colour blue. Why should I paint red on the walls just to see? <laughs> that I'm happy with the, yeah. the wallpaper as it is. So this is your. Interest Islas Kalila 12, Bowmore 12. Have you got a preference and what's your general opinion on them? Well, I do like the Bowmore 12, I have to say. I think the, the Kalila is, is lovely, but it's when you taste the Bowmore, there's such a taste explosion with that one compared <laughs> to the Kalila. It's deeper, it Aye, it really is. Uh, you get a uh, there's so much going on with, with this. Well good stuff mm. uh, we'll finish these off and we'll move on to the next level we'll, we'll start repeatedly punching you <laughs> in the throat I'm in the looking face. forward to that day <laughs> so, yes. uh, see you soon <laughs> moving along we're on to another couple of whiskies we've got four glasses two each here so Graham has brought another whiskey he's going to have Unveil what he's brought. What have you got, Graham? An Ockentoshin. Ockentoshin. Where from? Tell us about it. Well, it's uh, I, I'm going to put my my drinking glasses on oh, for a second. Your, your beer goggles. <laughs> your whiskey goggles. <laughs> so this is a it's a Glasgow uh, whiskey. Now, so a single malt, but an American oak finish. So I'll, I'll let you uh, have a, a wee look at the bottle. I like to read the blurb, yes. Right. And I'll have a look at the bottle. So Ockentosh and Single Malt, Scotch Whiskey, triple, S triple distilled for extra smoothness. Well, aye. Now, I always wondered about this, triple distilled, because the Irish triple distill their whiskey, don't they? And we don't. Yes, we double generally. distill. I think there's one or two, Ockentosh being one, oh, forget, there's one or two others that triple distill, but... The Irish whiskey is as far as I know is triple distilled. And just to, so you know it's triple distilled, there are three stills triple distilled. American oak, smooth and vibrant, mm. so American oak casks, maturation in first and second fill bourbon casks. So you're expecting the woody oakiness, it's not too dark, you can see that. It's uh, a it's a forty percenter. Distillery manager Francis Conlon. Franco, Mad Franco Conlon. <laughs> Big Mad Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Francis, if you're watching. Maybe, maybe you are crazy. But anywho, yeah, 40% crafted in Glasgow. Not distilled in Glasgow, crafted in Glasgow since 1823. And you're holding one of the only triple distilled single malt Scotch whiskies. Mm. We've been crafting Ockentoshin in the city since 1823. Och un un let it roll off your tongue. Ockentoshin. Mm. It's not it's not the hard case. Och. Surely. Field. Och. Yes. Och, yes. A C H or A U C H Gaelic. Coming into English in a lot of place names mm. means field. Ochter Machti. Do you know what Ochter means? I hope you do because I'm not I do. Field of the big pig sty. I knew it was, uh, field, it was <laughs> pig related. <laughs> so Ochter Machti, where the proclaimers come from. It is. Uh, the well, people. where they hail from now, they're obviously Leith boys at heart. We travel the world to find the finest wood. Our classic American oak single malt Scotch whiskey is mellowed in only the finest bourbon casks. 
nobody would choose yeah. a whiskey on average or subpar. Yeah. Let's get some crap bourbon yeah. casks yeah. in. Yeah. What's the worst one you've got? <laughs> <laughs> Any holes in them? Uh, yeah, the finest bourbon casks. Sourced from American distilleries. Well, bourbon. Mm. The result is a smooth, perfectly balanced lowland single malt with subtle notes of coconut, vanilla, and rich toffee. So we're, uh, we're looking. You, you think American oak, you're going to get the toffee, mm. vanilla, coconut as well. Coconut's an interesting one. What are you getting there? Colour, golden amber, nose, vanilla, coconut, and fresh citrus zest. Mm. Definitely get the vanilla and the nose. Now, there's a really different smell about it, and I'm guessing this is down to the, the triple distillation. Mm. A different feel of smell, if that makes sense. It doesn't make sense, but that's what I'm, what I'm saying. It's not bad, it's, it's nice, it's good in the nose. Um, I think the, the main Ockintosh is a triple wood, so three different barrels. Mm. Um, so vanilla, coconut and fresh citrus zest. You definitely get that a kind of puddingy taste right initially. Almost oh, a dough, mm. would you say? Yeah. There's, like, um, mm. uh, there's a chico pudding that you get, the golden sort of chico pudding. Aye. But maybe a bit undercooked somehow, so that, that more sort of doughy without malty doughiness. That's sweet, sweet and fresh, it's, it's nice, mm. it's got little floral notes, it's, uh, it's interesting on the nose. I don't think I've had this, I've tried two or three Ockentoshans in the dim and distant past. I don't know if there's something. Mm. I'm not sure what it is. You don't know if there's something. No, they're, they're, it's a wee bit undefinable. It's kind of like there's a gap uh, somehow. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Um, it's a lovely flavour, but the after taste is not quite. I've not done quite a, there. I've done a taste review of the Glen Scotia 18. And it's reminded me a lot of that, um, which is a Campbelltown. So mm. sweet. It's got that's the citrus essence. So it's sort of saying orangey. It's not lime. It's not lemon. It's a sweetness, and it's quite mm. high in the nose. A little bit floral. There is a wee bit orangey kind of thing there, but I don't know whether it's because I've been drinking smoky whiskies. There may be I'm missing the smokiness. I've not been watching. Have you tasted this? Hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, definitely. No, I've tasted it over um, and breathed in my my normal. Can you breathe in? <laughs> <laughs> Taste. Well, I like to get it on the on my tongue. But and so just your, your nose and your breath. No, but it's just drawing a bit of breath over my tongue while well, I've I've got it sitting there, and and when the breath comes over, it, it adds a different. Flavour. This could be a revolutionary new tasting technique. So you hold it in your mouth and you breathe over the top. Aye. And just like right. suck it in. I'm gonna try, you know I mean? I'm gonna try you, this. You got a wee hit. It, it, it definitely punches you in the face a bit more. I'm mm. not sure about this. <laughs> I like it. I, I well. That it, do you know what? That that is very, very nice. It's um, it's it occupies me around the bottom. On the nose, it was up here, and the mouth, it's down mm. there somehow. I don't know, I don't know how that works. But there's definitely that lemony kind of aftertaste. Still, I'm more citrus. in the orange eye. It's definitely mm. citrus, but I'm not getting the sharpness. So it's more sweet, orangey. A little bit of the wood, not as much of that dough. It's more, it's more not a bit, a bit syrupy. Hmm. What is it? Forty percent. Aye. Yeah, there's no real mm. smash. There's no real offence. Hmm. That's not too bad. That's very mild. It's like a a breakfast whiskey. Yeah. Could have it with your porridge in the morning. Aye, a, a breakfast aperitif. Aye. Once you've had breakfast. Um, there is a hotel yeah, we yeah. stay at on tour where they 
you get your porridge and we've got a decanter of whiskey next to it and obviously when you're driving it's not the best thing to do is to add whiskey to your porridge but uh, it's, it could be breakfast whiskey so talking about tours mm. um, we're both based out of Edinburgh capital of Scotland indeed where about on tour uh, do you enjoy going any any favourite spots well even though I've been there a hundred times Glencoe remains my uh, beautiful place to be it, it really does I, I love it it's so it's so um, picturesque and craggy and Graham Graham what's wonderful. a glen <laughs> yeah a glen is a Scots Gaelic name for a uh, a valley carved out by the last ice age so you have glens and straths a, gl a glen is a v-shaped valley a strath is a u-shaped valley but glencoe even when i was a child and my mom and dad used to take us to the, the highlands on holiday i loved glencoe i was always spellbound driving through there i thought it was such a magical beautiful place and then when i started doing this job when i became a tour guide i decided to investigate glencoe a bit more and research it a bit and then I found out that I've got a family connection there um, so when I go on tour I wear my, my kilt you've seen it mm -hmm. the, the Henderson Tartan okay. it's my mother's side of the family um, and I found out that the Hendersons were the ceremonial bodyguards and pipers of McKeon MacDonald of Glencoe they all died in the massacre the fateful chief exactly uh, and Big Jock Henderson was the uh, the, the piper of McKeon at the time and he was shot in the back uh, during the Glencoe Massacre and I only found this out during my time as a tour guide and I, it was a beautiful thing I found that I, all this time I had a family connection to that place and maybe that was why I felt so uh, at peace and I felt like I was home mm -hmm. every time I drove through Glencoe and I still feel like that now and I tell my punters that when I'm driving through there, I was like, by the way, my ancestor died here during that. There's a place uh, in Glencoe called the Henderson the Stone. You know what I mean? Right. There's the no. Henderson Stone that's Where in celebration. Uh, right up in um, where the, the original settlement was, where they found, they've started to excavate it now, and they found actually some um, like remnants of the old village life back in 1692 when the, that, that disaster uh, happened. And we still talk about it. I mean, you've probably spoken about it. Um, many tour guides do. Some choose not to even mention it because it's such a horrible stain I think on our history. To, you have to find a way to mention it. Mm. So Glencoe, one of the most naturally um, beautiful spots in Scotland, very picturesque. It's quite a narrow valley, very high-sided. And when the cloud mm. covers low, it's almost like it's got a ceiling. It, it's hypnotic. It so really physically, mm. on its own, it's, it stands apart. And then you've got the terrible events, the 13th of February, 1692, Aye. known as the Massacre at Glencoe. One of the blackest periods in British history, never mind Scottish history. In effect, the king turning his soldiers on his subjects, massacring the... His own uh, subjects. His own yeah. subjects, yes. So, it's you know, a, it just adds they, an air of melancholy to the whole place. Part of the, well, I don't know if this is true, but George R. R. Martin, the creator of Game of Thrones, actually talks about the Red Wedding, that uh, that famous episode in Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. and, and likens it, that he got inspired by the, the massacre of Glencoe, the, the betrayal of hospitality, the whole kind of turning on your, your, your hosts, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that whole thing. But he kind of reversed it a bit. But... That's what inspired them, and, and that's what I love about doing this job. Is as you travel around Scotland, you tell these wee stories, and you forget how how really quite bleak and horrible they are. And mm -hmm. uh, we don't have many happy stories in Scotland. There are not many happy endings. No. It's all blood battles and betrayals. It's amazing you say that. Um, my last tour ended yesterday. I was on a six day out of Hebrides tour. We came through Glencoe on the way back mm. down. I gave I gave it from Henry the Eighth in the fifteen hundreds <laughs> right. right through to sixteen ninety two. And when we got to Glencoe, somebody said, "There's not many happy stories." Yeah, I could maybe find one or two. It was a hard uh, life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, 
but yeah, an amazing place. <coughs> uh, that's what nice but no, I do. I love it, uh, and and that that's why I've done what sixty odd Vauxhnes tours. Every time I drive through Glencoe, it looks different. It becomes a different place. The light is different. The season's different. It's just a magical place. It really is. Absolutely. Uh, it can sometimes be just rain and mist, but. 5% of the time, mm. every other time it's good. Right, so on the subject of depressing stories, have you got <laughs> Here any, we go. Have you got any happy, have you got any jokes or any anecdotes you tell uh, anything? <laughs> right, well just to kind of set things I'm, up. I'm going to pour a wee Lafroy quarter cast, so this is the one that you, if you don't like Lafroy's, I poured you one of these, so we might as well. So one of my general stories when I'm leaving Edinburgh is, of course we have people from all over the world on our buses and they may not understand the kind of intricacies of of the relationship between Scotland and England, particularly on sporting occasions. They, they don't quite get it. So my wee tale, my wee anecdote to them to kind of explain how much this uh, rivalry means to us in Scotland is, as we're driving past Murrayfield Stadium, I'll say to people, look, I get into your rugby, do you love your rugby? And, if they, and whether they do or they don't, they're getting a story anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll say, look, we love our rugby in Scotland, um, particularly when we're playing England. We don't care if every team in the world beats us, as long as we beat the English. That's all that matters to us. And I'll give you an, a case in point. So, a couple of years ago, Scotland were playing England, and... You can't get tickets for this game. It's just impossible. Everybody wants to go and see that game. However, I got two tickets for me and my son. We went to the game, get in and the stadium's bouncing, it's lively, it's wonderful, the atmosphere's incredible. And we sit down, not a seat free in the whole house, apart from the one right next to me. And I can't understand, why is this? And I say to the gentleman next to me, quite an elderly gentleman, yes. I said to him, look, do you, do, you have, do you know why this seat's empty? Every other seat in the house is taken. He's like, ah, oh, son, I said, I've got to tell you, um, I bought two tickets for my wife and I. It's our golden wedding anniversary. 50 years we've been married. I was like, oh, congratulations. He went, well, well wait, wait, wait a minute. He said, I'm sorry to say that uh, last week she died. I was like, I'm sorry. I, I'm really sorry. I, 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 I shouldn't have even asked you the question. Uh, he said, look, don't you worry about it, son. You carry on. Watch the game. We're beating England. We're getting to half time. This is amazing. This doesn't happen. The game is amazing. But this is bugging me. It's, it's clawing at the back of my mind. So we get to half time and I turn to the elderly gentleman. I said to him, look, sir, I'm sorry. I need to ask you this question. This is such a popular game. Everybody in Scotland wants to come to this game. Why didn't you just give that ticket to, to another member of your family or to one of your friends? He said, oh, I couldn't do that, son. They're all our funeral today. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much we love rugby in Scotland, <laughs> especially against the English. <laughs> so, aye, that's my wee, we're leaving the Edinburgh story. Out of town, yes. <laughs> And then you kick into the massacre of Glencoe and <laughs> it all goes on. <laughs> exactly. It depress everybody again. Very good, very good. Aye, we've all got our, uh, our little... Oh, hi. Hey. So <laughs> that just crept up in me oh, there. Hey. I didn't even Forgot sniff it. I, I, was, I was telling that story and I just had a wee sip. There's whoa. So. Wow. We're back into the Lafroy Corkasque. It's 48%. I think I said 46%. Right. I was wondering if it tells me anything about see, that. Right, I'd always associate Lavrahaig with being rough as assholes. Really rough. And it would, it would or as we say in Scotland, batteries. Yeah. <laughs> it would batter you about. But that's, I suppose that's from when I drank it in my 30s and um, your tastes change over the years. It's funny you should say that. So, first of all, I'm still laughing because we've still got to take you to the top end of Isla. And I don't mm. think that Lafroy is anymore at the top end of Isla. Uh, I've spoke to one or two guides in the past, and they say that La the Lafroy 10 now isn't what it was 20 years ago. Right. It used to be that hospital floor cleaner, the antiseptic, Aye. the, the Dettol, um, that sort of... It was like getting smacked in the face, Aye. really 
Uh, we are dirty ass street. Here's a wee Lafroig factoid for you: is that you you know about prohibition in the states in the nineteen twenties? Mm. So alcohol was banned, but Lafroig apparently was the only whiskey they could still sell because it was marketed as a medicine, and it had that medicinal quality. Really? So. Uh, well, I'm mm. a tour guide, so I always double check everything. <laughs> yeah. But that's what I've been told. <laughs> okay. So legend has it. It used to be much more medicinal, even up until 2000 ish. But mm. when you taste the 10 year old now, it's not that offensive. No, it's and really not. This is a lot less offensive than the quarter cask. So what it's saying there, it's up to about 30% extra contact with the wood mm. in the quarter cask. So that's why you're. It's four or five year old, but you're getting a much sort of more rounded mm. flavour off it. So yes, the Ockintoshin, it was okay. It was interesting. Yeah. It's uh, that was a non-age statement. It was a supermarket single malt, if you like. Um, as well, it was say, very palatable. Aye, aye, absolutely. There's, there's no bad. It's like the, there's no bad tartans. There's tartans that you like more or less. Mm. There's no bad whiskies. There's whiskies that you you enjoy more or less. But uh, the Lafroy Quarter Cast. When I did my wee tasting, check the video. Lafroy Quarter Cast Triple Wood Ten Year Old. This one came out on top. So uh, you'll see this in your supermarkets as well. Mm. Non age statement. Quite young. People that don't like young whiskies. Good. Don't go near this. So we what are you looking at in the supermarkets for that? Normally, uh, thirty-five pound. Right, uh, and you might get the the ten pound knocked off. Ah. Get it on offer like the Bowmore Twelve, something like that. It's one of their core range. It's quite widely available. It's quite young, so they can make mm. it quite easily. Uh, ah, it's 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 up there with the ten-year-old. No, in it's my very. Opinion, I, no, it's very nice. Um, I'm I'm surprised at how much I like it. So the, the first sort of whiskey that I shared with Graham on tour with the uh, Lagavulin in sixteen, he told me he didn't like the like it. told me he didn't like the Lafroig at all. I was like, oh, I had this actual bottle with me on that <laughs> tour. I was like, come back to my place, darling. <laughs> <laughs> I will show you <laughs> something you like. I'll teach you something about Lafroig, <laughs> and we we did this. So when I say to Graham, you've got to come around for a wee video. I'll give you some more. Isla single malts he says you can give me as many Isla single malts that I don't like as you possibly <laughs> can find so that's what we're doing tonight aye so still, still it. enjoying it let's <laughs> 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 free the way so <laughs> yeah I hate it give me some more <laughs> no as uh, but I think um, as, I, as I said m my taste buds were younger they had 10 12 years younger and I tried the laugh leg and I, I, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was a 10 year, maybe it was a 12 year. I, I really don't know, but I knew instantly that I hated it. And it put me off all smoky whiskies for ages mm -hmm. until I kind of crept back in with the, the Talisker. And then the, the Lagerville in 16, I was like, wow, this is the best thing I've ever tasted mm -hmm. in my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's the way of putting it you mm. tiptoe you creep back in mm. the Talisker's very lightly smoked a lot of mm. people don't like it it's not got much flavour about it no it's no. got that smokiness mm. just a gentle smokiness a wee bit of saltiness else. as well to it I, I liked mm -hmm. as well because it was kind of um, the, the the taste of the the sea of sky it was like the taste of the, the sea loch you were standing in, you know, where you can smell the air, what you were talking about with Bowmore. Of course. Before, mm -hmm. where you can just kind of transport yourself back to standing outside the distillery by tasting their whiskey. Yep. So, mm -hmm. uh, and so wonderful, like anybody that really loves their whiskey needs to go and visit more distilleries, needs to go and, and be where it's made, because the next time you drink it, it'll transport you right back there. Absolutely. And that's a beautiful thing. It's a wee tip as a tour guide, Graham. I'm sure you know this, but um, if you can give them something to taste, to feel, mm. to smell, to hold, you can talk at them all day. But it's, yeah, if they take it, take this home, drink it at home, it takes them straight back to where they Especially if they're getting bevied. Pete smoke. Especially if it's alcohol. Hi. Absolutely. So there we go. For a little lock and toshin. We've had a, mm. One of us has had a full Lafroy quarter cast, the other one of <laughs> us will be uh, finishing his, and we will move on now to my final two whiskies. I'm going to take you right to the very top. 
So you thought the Freud was smoky and mm. abrasive and sandpaper and ashtrays and all that sort of stuff. Wait until you find out what I've got for you next, Graham. Yeah, you okay. report it. Can it wait? Good. <laughs> so, final whiskies of the evening. We're ramping it up for Graham. We've done the intro islands, the Clear 12, the Bomore 12. Mm. We've moved it up a little bit with the Lafroy quarter cask. Graham's uh, mm. toshin. Aye, but I think the quarter cask is could possibly be one of my new favourites. Right in behind the Lagavulin oh, 60. Oh, there's nothing topping that right now. Okay, okay. Well, I reckon you're maybe making a, an early judgment because we've oh, got two whiskies to come okay, and okay. I, I'm, I've kept them under wraps. Any 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 guesses as to what's to come? What's above the Lafroy 10? <sighs> Do you know? Any guesses? Are we, are we going hard big? Are well, we going there's an hard bag. Um, so it's one out of the two. Any anything else? Hmm. Well, that well, it can only be another lager villain. No, nope, no. Nope. So there's the hard bag ten. Core range. Have you got your whiskey goggles? Aye, I'll get my tasting glasses on. <laughs> tasting glasses. <laughs> I love the hard bag bottles, beautiful shape, dark green glass. Um, that's, nice. that's one of them. We'll be putting some of this in a glass. Non chill filter. Non chill filtered. Have you any idea about the chill filtered? Well, does it need to be chill filtered? Ah, there's the eternal debate. Chill filtration, quite simply, as it comes out of the cask, it's got all the bad bits in it, a bit of maybe sort of sediment, and maybe a little bit oily. And if you add a little bit of water, it can mm. cloud the whiskey. So if you chill filter it, you take all that oil out, you get rid of any sediment, and when you add your ice or your water, it stays clear. So the argument is that if you are in a penthouse suite in New York and you order a whiskey, you put water in it and it clouds, you're going to think there's something wrong with it. So for those sorts of people, you want wanting chill filtered whiskey. For your whiskey aficionados, if you chill filter it, then you're taking stuff out of it. It's not how it should be. So, your whiskey snobs, like me and you, Graham, I'm, I'm <laughs> going to teach you how to be a whiskey aye. snob. You want non chill filtered. You want everything well, that comes out of the cask in aye. the bottle. See, because uh, Dalwini, for example, doesn't need to chill filter because it's so high up in the mountains, it's already chill, the water, when mm. it comes in. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. Well, would you agree? Uh, yep. Do you know, because Dalwini is one of the highest altitude distilleries, Aye. that the, the, alcohol, the alcohol goes to your head a little bit more quickly than the normal whiskies. Aye. So there you go. So we've got Ardbeg, we've got the Ardbeg 10. Why don't you pour that? We've got uh, some bigger glasses for the end of the night, just to finish it in some sort of style. So a couple of stem glasses, a couple of big Glencairn glasses. So where are we going? Well, it's up to you, middle or outsides, one of the two. That's whiskey number one. This one I'm pretty sure you won't know about. It was the newest distillery in Isla before Kil, uh, before Ardnaho. And this is a Kilhoman, Kilhoman Macher Bay. So, have a little mm. sniff out the bottle of the Ardbeg. I need to get my sniffing <laughs> glasses on. So we started at Lagavulin, we had a little bit of my Infinity mm. bottle, we've come through the Kalila and the Bomore, and we're now going to what I think are the two out of core range whiskies. we're not talking cast strength, we're not talking limited edition, two core range whiskies: the Ardbeg 10 and the Kilhoman Macher Bay. Even the bottle looks spectacular. That's, that's a bottle you want in a fight. Aye. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. You're messing about with this <laughs> bottle, man. Take people down. Aye. So, the mm. Ardbeg. I reckon the Ardbeg on the nose is going to be more powerful, but we'll see what you think in the mouth. That moth needs to get the fuck. <laughs> So, the stem glass is the Kilhoman. Right, check it out. Put it there. Right, uh, start with the Kilhoman. Have a nose. Yes. Oh, it 
it does not betray oh, what is to wow. come. But there's a sweetness there, there's a lightness mm. there. It's a bit malty. It's not got an age statement. It's, it's quite a mild um, smooth. A bit of cereal in there as well. Now, Kilhoman is a farm distillery, so they make, they grow their own barley, not exclusively, mm. but they distill on site, obviously, they mature on site, but they bottle it on site, they, they stick their labels on on mm -hmm. site, so they're sort of self contained. I love that. Are we uh, like a micro distillery? Basically, sort of yeah, thing? yeah. They, they, they do it all, it doesn't get shipped to the mainland, it's not. Ah, it's all done by them. Absolutely. Wonderful. So, you've got your established distilleries, 200 years plus, Ardbeg, Lagavulin, and Lefroy, but more, one of the oldest, but then you've got new distilleries doing a good job, trying their best. Wow. Aye. Not on the nose, boom, Aye. on the throat. Fucking hell. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I bet. That's, That's quite that's a that's surprising that's one. Because um, when you smell it, you don't get oh. that, that absolute smash. Absolutely, it's like a, it's a flamethrower down your throat. And there's where the island mm. whiskey comes in. So that's coming off the cask, off the barrel, off the chard, um, something else. This is, a I really do think, an underrated Isla firestorm. Mm. The Kilhoman Macker being. It's certainly fiery. Aye. Absolutely. So you've got the smoke, you've got the ash, you've got the burnt wood. All that stuff, bit of earthiness. It's young. It's not got an age statement, so mm. you're talking single figures. But this is part of Kilhoman's core range. Now Kilhoman, it's over in the West Isle. And we were talking earlier about the progression of whisky or distillation coming to Scotland, and there's mm. a, a decent story that the art of distillation, the whisky making knowledge, came to Scotland from Ireland to Kilhoman on Isla and then spread through Scotland. So so that was one of the earliest? Well, it's a new distillery, but mm. it's possibly where the, mm. the knowledge of distillation or distilling whisky came to Scotland. So we think it came from Ireland? Mm. There was a story to do with a wedding dowry, and part of the dowry was that the there was X amount of working men came across and some of those were distillers and they came across to Kilhoman on Isla. So we're crediting the Irish for coming up with whiskey before us, are we? Inventing it. Aye. But remember, the Scots then perfected it. Well, okay. That's fine. The Irish almost certainly had whiskey before us. Mm. That's fine. But it's, it's decent. But we've perfected it. Well, there is, there is no doubt that Scotch whiskey is the best in the world. Amber nectar, what can you Absolutely. say? Absolutely. So what's your first uh, thoughts on the Kilhoman Macker Bay? It's, uh, it's surprising, because to smell it you get a, a very subtle kind of citrusy. It's quite light, you're not expecting Aye. too much. And then when you taste it, wow. But for me that's above the Lefroy it, it really, yeah, you're right, it's, it's a bigger punch in the throat than the Lefroy. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's jumping up when you thought right and obviously I've saved the the hard bag for last so mm. Mm. so put that down nose the hard bag and if you don't get in it you'll, you'll get the burn off the nose on the hard bag I'll let that um, <laughs> dissipate first fizzle out <laughs> so this is the hard bag 10 now hard bag I love Isla I love mm. Isla beyond belief I cannot talk it up enough and out of Isla, mm. my favourite distillery to visit is the Ardbeg distillery. Mm -hmm. Why? As a tour guide, Graham, you'll know, going into places, it's all very well if you get treated nicely, welcomed, politeness, but what you're wanting is your passengers to be given a good time. Mm. And Ardbeg are exceptional. Uh, there's a lady, a good lady called Jackie, who runs the Ardbeg Visitor Centre, and she's got all the guides trained she's outstanding herself they're friendly they're knowledgeable they've got as much time as you need they know their stuff inside out mm. and I've, it's not that I've never had a bad experience I have never had a bad experience in there but I've always had a great experience at Ardbeg so mm. thanks to Jackie but this is the Ardbeg 10 
So this was first produced, I think, in 2010. They reopened in 2000, and since then, it's been getting all sorts of dedicated followers. Mm -hmm. So some great marketing, some be a beautiful bottle, nice yeah. um, font, and some great, um, what, what they found at Ardbeg, oh, this is a 10, so even 10, it doesn't say, it's not got one zero, it's T-E-N. Yeah, yeah. So mm. um, they found that giving things names encourages people to buy it. So things like the Aura Verdes, the Galileo, the Supernova, great right. branding. There's a subtlety to that that's very, very good. To the branding or to the whiskey? To the the branding, mm -hmm. yeah. But but also to the whiskey, because well, I've not tasted it yet, but on the nose you can certainly feel a step up in the kind of earthiness to it. So this was a little bit light on the nose, heavy mm. in the throat. Well, this is quite heavy on the nose. So Have a little sip. What do you think of the Ardbeg Ten? This is this is. Hmm. Wow. Well, that's a wee bit um, surprising. That's quite. That's quite lovely. It's quite sharp. Very sharp. For a ten-year-old, it's not got the the most depth. Mm -hmm. The best way I describe this, it's like if if your job was to go around with a metal brush and scrape the warehouse floor and get the stones and the grit and the <laughs> sawdust and the dust. And then Put it in a glass. squeeze it through the mop. <laughs> <laughs> and then That's it. it. <laughs> it's, and people think, ooh, ooh, ooh. Ah, no, 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 no. It's, uh, But see, that's what you want. You want a wee bit of. You want something to just surprise you. Just to, to just punch you right in the taste buds. That you think, whoa. And that I never expected that. Character. Aye. Oomph. Um, because yeah. otherwise, what's the point? What's the point of um, trying different whiskies if you don't actually get that wee surprise? It's lovely. Enjoy. It's a beautiful thing. I fucking love whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> more and more. But more. it's more a case of if you head away for like a night away or whatever it is, like I want to go somewhere where fill enthusiasts we're just going to go there. Like, mm. This is a huge night. We want to taste that. Whiskey, whiskey, whiskey is for sharing. Um, yeah, absolutely. It, it's a communal thing, isn't it, really? Because yeah. my, my appreciation for whiskey improved when I was sitting drinking it with you because yeah. I could sit and drink it with one of my mates who doesn't know a fucking thing about whiskey and I'm like, well... He's no really uh, feeling it, but, but yeah. drinking it with you and we're like, but you knew like, it was good, aye. But I helped you understand, aye. It's but you were asking me questions like, what can you actually taste there? And that was a wonderful because I was like, well, what can I actually taste? And it made me think about it because my palate I didn't think was that good, but I can actually spot these undercurrents of flavours. Mm -hmm. Within these different whiskies. Oh, see, you're you're smelling more than I can smell mm. when I smell the whiskies. I'm just like, and I can't smell it. But, but it then, seems to be the more pissed I get, the better I get at actually <laughs> yeah, tasting yeah. them as well. You know what I mean? Because I hear I smell a whiskey, and I'm like, oh my god, that's like a sweet from my childhood. And he's like, I never smell that. I, I, it just takes you. Well, to, I do, with that okay toshin, and I didn't say it tonight, but. I kind of tasted Palma Violets in yeah, there at one point, it. and yeah. I was like, I fucking hate Palma Violets, I hate, but yes. I don't, I didn't like them. I, I they were them. shit sweets. Yes, they really were. But, but you know the smell of them. Aye, yeah. but I tried them, <laughs> and I could taste it in there, and I was like, even though I don't like that taste, See it though. I can recognise it and appreciate it and quite like it in this context. Oh, yeah. So with no all these other flavours that are that are mixed that, in, that, the whole and I don't, it, it's, it's amazing but how no, many flavours you can get see, from different flavors, whiskies. It's the like flavours you were even saying, you're like, I can smell lemon. Lem I, I was like, I've never smelled lemon. But so you drinking the Ardbeg Ten there? Oh yeah, 
Oh, yeah. Aye. What do you think of it? Add a bit of water if you want. Yes. Opinions are good. This is an excellent, excellent whiskey. I really do. I mean, I can't... I can't tell you the flavours I'm getting from this, but uh, maybe... Well, what are you getting from it, Keith? Well, I get wood. I get a, quite an acrid sort of um, burntness, so I'm not getting too much in the way of your. It's generally bourbon barrels, and therefore you're talking your toffee and your caramel. Mm. But it's it's these are these barrels are charred. Um, if you get the chance, game, if you ever got to Speyside or anywhere, I suppose that's got a cooperage, and you watch the barrels being built, and the barrels will often be made to order. And if the the char the inside it almost goes like alligator skin, and that's what they're uh, looking for quite uh, quite often at Ardbeg is that charredness, uh, and then you've got more sort of interaction between the spirit and the wood, and you get mm. that smoky. It's not just from the the peat drying the barley; it's from the barrel and the maturation as well. But a lot of the barrels will come already ready made ready from bourbon or sherry barrels well when they bring them across they're, they're, at, they're, they're broken down they're not they? flat and then they rebuild them they're in pieces we, ah. we rebuild them and then they can be made to order so they can be charred mm. on the inside or whatever you want to is a dying trade for that as well I think Cooperage uh, dying would mean that you're talking X amount now down to Y amount I don't know what the numbers are, but there are there, there is a cooperage on Speyside, mm. and individual distilleries have their cooperages. So it's maybe a declining trade yeah, yeah. I'll go with, but I don't know about dying trade. Mm. But that's why I'm saying... Well, you've got to hope it, it, it survives. Uh, the good lady wife was in the cooperage up at Speyside. Did you enjoy that? <laughs> well, we're I, about then. I think she, she says did. yes. She was getting involved now. She's not getting involved. So, if you get the chance to go to the Cooperage, absolutely, it's a fascinating place. Watch them, it's all physical labour, they get paid per barrel, every barrel has to be identical, even though it's handmade, they've got to make them all the same size, same shape, and the most hated person in the Cooperage is the quality control guy, because he's making sure that they stand up to a good bashing, mm. that they're more or less airtight, that the, the bungholes in the same place, all the rest of it so yeah it's uh, it's but an see, integral part I, I love that but I'm sure it is a dying trade because who who goes to be an apprentice cooper these days I mean it's not one of these trades that are kind of, you'll go and be a builder a bricklayer a joiner but who goes to be a cooper these days well I hope I hope kids do. I, I really do. But these these old trades are are just dying away. I'm not sure how many distilleries are in the lowlands. We're well, talking maybe a dozen or so. So where most of the population lives, there's proportionally no coopers. Mm. But up on Speyside, where the biggest concentration of distilleries is, they've got a dedicated cooperage, and they have apprentice coopers. And they're very good at not telling you how much they earn, but mm. I'm guessing that they earn in the region of 50 to 60 to 70 grand a year. Wow. So, exactly. That's good money. That's good money. It's well above mm. the national average. They get paid piecemeal, so they get paid for every barrel they make. And if they can make a barrel in three or four minutes to the same quality all day, every day, mm. it's not easy, it's hard work, but it's skilled work. Yeah. And it's, it's very well paid. So, just like that, they're not getting paid 10, 12, 15 grand a year, they're getting paid 50 grand mm. a year. They're driving Subaru and pretzels. They're uh, going to the, the, the local well, hotels. Well, good. I hope, I hope it, it does become a lucrative apprenticeship to have. Because things like that should be protected. That's our national heritage, having trades like that, having people that can actually do that and bring on the next generation of Coopers and uh, and barrel makers, you know. I absolutely agree. Uh, a wee anecdote from when I was over in Lewis. Um, obviously, on on the Lewis and Harris style of Harris, you got Harris Tweed, mm. integral absolutely, heritage. Yeah. 
I visited the, the mill over there and there was a guy working there who was 78 and he'd been working there since he was five. <laughs> so he'd been working there for 73 years. Wow. And I don't think they fully appreciated what they had. Mm. Uh, they were doing it by the traditional style. They were doing it, they, they did all the different processes. There's 20 odd processes to make the harvest weed. And I don't work for the Scottish government, but if I did, that was worth preserving keep this work and keep the, the, the culture the history and mm. what he knew he knew the stories from somebody else who was 73 years in Aye. that trade there's 150 years worth of stories in two people and that is worth put, put, I say worth put a value on it but see this is the thing about the Celts um, it was never about um, what was written down um, the, the history of the Celts and, and the way the Celtic people spoke it, it was it was never written down, it was oral history. It would be passed from generation to generation in song uh, and poetry and, and stories, really wonderful stories about the landscape and the, the everything around them. Everything that, that, that meant something to them. That was what the Celtic um, histories were about. So we've got to be a bit um, sceptical of, of written histories and the history that we are fed in the, in the books, in the textbooks over the, the decades that you were at school, I was at school, that we were told. We were taught the history of the British Empire, Keith. Of we course. weren't taught the history of Scotland. Of course. And now I'm starting to learn the history of Scotland and where that sits. And, you know, um, uh, well, I, I'm not going to pontificate about it now, but there, there are things that bother me about uh, the history of Scotland when it comes to its place amongst the, Have you the heard British the, Empire. the song Sorley by Nightworks? Yes. Ah, I, so Sorley McLean talking about the decline of his language, the decline of, well, how he's always sceptical of received history. Yes. Aye, received, aye. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. So the differences between, and we're not talking countries here, we're talking languages. The difference mm. between the Gaelic history, the oral language, the that oral they history, told each other, yes, absolutely, that was passed down word to mouth, generation after generation, and the differences between that history and what they were told the in the textbooks, English language aye, history, exactly. that anglicised version of history mm. that was written down, that was the official history. And he's like, well, there's one history, there's another history. I'm not even taking sides, but there's two histories here. History is written by the winners, ultimately. That that that's the, all I would say about it is history is written by the winners, and you never ever hear the losers' side of the story in so the history books. Just, just to, oh. round, to round it all up, where does the word whiskey come from? Which language? Uska. Uska. Yeah. So it comes from the Gaelic language. It does. So for me, the water of life. The Gaelic language is the winner of history. Right. Slange of Agriam, thanks Slange for coming. Ah, you're welcome. We'll see you again. Cheers. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> She's asleep. <laughs> you fell asleep there. You're crying yourself. Cut. Yeah. Cut. We're done. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be an outtake. Oh. Hey, no, quite. That was a good ending. I think.